So I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Mark O'Brien and Professor Michael Lavalette to our last panel of this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Mark O'Brien is Merseyside socialist activist and trade unionist. He is a coordinator of the Liverpool COP Climate Coalition and played a leading role in the organizing of the 6th of November Liverpool demonstration for the COP26 Coalition Global Day of Action. He has written widely on the history of social struggle in the UK, as well as on the experience of poverty in Liverpool communities and the impact of cuts to social spending. Professor Michael Lavalette is Dean of the School of Social Sciences at Liverpool Hope University. He's founder, member, and national coordinator of the Social Work Action Network. Has been invited keynote speaker at various international social work uh, events, including the Canadian, Croatian, Greek, and Spanish Social Work Association conferences, the Santa Cristi State Social Work Conference in Brazil, and the European Masters in Social Work Program in Maastricht. He's co-editor of the journal Critical and Radical Social Work and co-editor of the book series Critical Debates in Social Work um, for, by Policy uh, Press. So they're going to talk to us about organizing for climate justice in Liverpool called Climate, Co climate Coalition, but also Glasgow, Hope Students, Mobilization. So to both of you, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Yeah. OK. I would, you just want us to go? Because, Martin, do you want to start? <laughs> or do you want me to go? Yeah, so, OK. Is that OK? Good. All right. That's fine. Um, well, th first of all, thank you so much for the invitation um, to have this vitally important discussion about the really the, the most important challenge facing humanity, <laughs> let's face it. Um, so I, I've been, for this presentation, I've been asked to reflect upon the experience of building uh, the COP26 climate change march in Liverpool on the 6th of November. So I'm speaking very much as, a, as an activist today. And I haven't got slides or anything. I'm just kind of speaking from notes. So I hope that, hope that works. Um, I'm going to talk about how we got the campaign started, the ways in which the campaign grew, the challenges we faced, and the character of the march itself. And also try and give a, an overall assessment of uh, what I think we achieved, and I, I do think that we achieved something. Uh, but before any of that, uh, what happened on the 6th of November? Well, it was the most amazing day of um, protest and rage around the world. Um, the Liverpool protest was one of 250 across the world called by the COP26 Climate Coalition, over 100,000 in Glasgow, uh, 20,000 in London, thousands marched in Bristol, Sheffield, Manchester, Oxford, Brighton, Birmingham, and so on. Um, in Liverpool, we think about 3,000 were on the march on the day. And who was there? School students, trade unionists, churches, community groups, campaign organisations. Uh, in Glasgow, of course, there was Greta Thunberg marching with the Glasgow refuse workers, a very important moment of working class solidarity. And all of that energy and anger stood in stark contrast, really, to the... Um, miserably poor outcomes, I would say, from the COP26 itself. But, but the movement globally, nationally and locally was tremendous. So what was our experience in Liverpool? Well, in mid-September, um, a handful of us met um, to discuss the possibility of initiating a COP26 climate coalition hub. Um, we worked out that we knew three or four more people who are interested in uh, who are interested in the climate change agenda or interested in the climate change movement. And on the basis of that really quite unpropitious start, we decided to try and initiate a hub. Now, at that point, it would have been very easy. And given, given our starting point, even in some ways sensible to have kept our ambitions for the, for the day in Liverpool very modest, maybe, maybe just having a a static protest for people who couldn't get to Glasgow or something. Uh, we knew that we were very late to the table. Um, some COP hubs in other parts of the country had been meeting since the early summer and some before that. And here we were having our first discussions just six weeks 
before the date itself. We talked it through, we considered how the media interest was already very strong and would only intensify as we got uh, nearer to the COP26. We also talked about the overriding urgency of the issue and decided, you know, if not now, and if, if, if not now, when, and if not us, then who? And in that spirit decided to go for it and to try and build a big um, Liverpool COP26 hub and to put the argument for a, um, a big Liverpool march and rally. Now, before we put out the, the call, we heard that an individual um, who some people here might know, Rona, who used to work at Hope until recently, who we'd met through an anti-fascist campaign on the Wirral, was seeking to call a meeting, so we contacted Rona. We joined up our initiatives and the result was a first meeting of just 10. However, a week later, um, our meeting had 26 at it and we decided to build a Liverpool mobilisation for the 6th of November, but also to support any other initiatives, you know, groups going, heading to Glasgow or London or, or, or wherever. Really, anything that anybody was doing was welcome. I think what gave us confidence to go for it like that was that there had been two other important events in the city that created what I would call the political energy on the left. Um, the first was an astounding victory at the University of Liverpool over a fight to prevent compulsory redundancies. The UCU branch there had fought a determined and successful campaign. It was interesting that later UCU members from the university um, got involved in the COP26 coalition and volunteered as stewards um, for the march. The second thing which I think is relevant to mention here um, is that there had been a, um, a big campaign to prevent an arms fair going ahead in the city. Uh, the organisers had mobilised thousands onto the streets to oppose the, the arms fair and had won high level political support from uh, with Jeremy Corbyn uh, coming to Liverpool to speak at the main demonstration. Uh, and again, many people from that campaign then became, became involved in the COP26 coalition. So a number of factors in the city were, were coming together. I know this is, this is a very local story, but I'm just reflecting um, my own experience as an activist, um, you know, kept playing a leading role in this. Um, so several things came together to create that kind of we can do it attitude and that sense of optimism of what could be achieved. So from that point, our coalition grew very rapidly. Um, over the next few days, the WhatsApp group grew to more than 100 and included Labour Party members, Extinction Rebellion, um, the Socialist Workers Party, that, that's my own organisation, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, the Green Party, uh, a range of individuals representing unions, local campaign groups, youth organisations, church groups, specific interest groups. Indeed, um, eventually more than 30 organisations um, would be represented in the coalition. There's a sense, I think, in which when the mood is there, with the, when the determination um, that's needed is there with the right call and with the right organisational form, the more the movement almost builds itself. Um, I mean, that's not literally true, of course, you need, you need leadership and people contribute in many different ways. But when the energy is there, when the will is there, people become uh, to people come forward, they take the initiative rather than hanging back and waiting for others to act. And the leadership in that situation becomes almost a kind of catalyst for an emergent movement. And that's what we began to see in Liverpool. So with just six weeks to build the march, the energy and the creativity were just amazing. Um, and I will dwell from a moment more um, on the diversity of the coalition um, and the range of political starting points and activist styles involved. I think it's probably the most diverse coalition I've ever been involved with, and I've, I've been in a few, but there were, you know, there were electoral parties, Labour Party, Green Party, organisations with a strong workplace orientation, trade unions, obviously, um, my own organisation, the Socialist Workers Party, I've, I've put under that header as well. Direct action organize, organizations, Extinction Rebellion, Friends of the Earth, cultural activists, um, people from various arts and crafts, um, movements and campaigns, church and social activists, um, the Liverpool Anglican Cathedral uh, got very involved, the Together Liverpool Church based Social Justice Network uh, were very important. Many non aligned activists, but what brought everyone together was a common commitment to making the hub a success and in building the biggest possible mobilization in the time that we had. 
um, the, the revolutionary socialist Leon Trotsky uh, wrote about um, the United Front as being a formation in which different forces march separately but strike together. Uh, I mean, Trotsky was talking about the situation of the French working class in 1936, actually. However, it's still a very powerful idea today. So although in the movement against climate change, we all have different starting points, different political styles, different traditions, still by identifying a clearly defined and very concrete program of action to work on together, we can be very effective and our actions can be very impactful. Now, I mean, that doesn't mean that we literally march, se march separately on the day. Sometimes there are blocks, uh, but usually we're all marching alongside of each other. So it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor, obviously. But it means, yes, of course, there are differences. No one hides their politics. But there's an understanding that, there's a, that there is an overriding need for practical unity on a very specific task. And in our case, um, that was achieving a successful mobilization. And the whilst debates go on, they take place outside the main business of the United Front, which is all about unity and action towards a concrete goal. So our focus was very practical. Um, we established, um, we had a, a working group, task group model of organization. We established working groups straight away. There was a coordinating group of five that I was part of, a trade union working group, an outreach working group for community links, um, a communications working group who were brilliant, did amazing social media work, uh, and a student working group. Now, reflecting upon how the coalition developed and speaking quite personally, actually, it, it, was, quite, it was quite unfamiliar territory, I have to say. Um, the involvement of the Liverpool Anglican Church, uh, cathedral rather, church activists, and the support of the Roman Catholic Church um, in publicising the march in parish bulletins and Sunday sermons, particularly were things that I hadn't anticipated. <laughs> Um, very many of the people in the coalition were new to political activism, but there, there were also experienced social justice campaigners. And I, I know we, we touched on it a moment ago in our discussion, but the, the social justice tradition, of course, goes way back in the churches. And I, I had encountered it before, actually, in the drop the debt movement in the late 90s and early 2000s and um, the campaign against third world debt. But it was interesting um, to be working once more with, with people from that tradition. And, it, and it, it, it made complete sense. I mean, climate justice and the hugely disproportionate impacts of climate change upon the global south were at the heart of the global COP movement. They were woven into its values, uh, as were support for refugees, calls for reparations, and the demands upon the industrialized countries to stop exploiting the poorer nations. Now, um, along with our mobilizing work, we had to deal with the local authorities in Liverpool. Uh, and I will say something about this because there were some significant challenges, but I think it's also from a social movement theory point of view, theory and practical practice point of view, I think there are some important things to, to comment on here, actually. The coordinators informed the police and the Liverpool City Council about the march. I, I was the named organiser for that purpose. This led to three joint agency JAG meetings with road safety managers, the police, the ambulance services, etc. And at the first JAG meeting, it was clear uh, to us that the police particularly really weren't happy about the march happening at all. Uh, and I have to say, were not at all helpful at that first meeting. There seemed to be a suspicion of environmental activists per se. Um, we were told that the police could offer no support whatever for traffic management or road safety. There was no sense at the first meeting that the role of the police might be to facilitate legitimate democratic and lawful protest. Instead, we were told that the police capacity was low, presumably we didn't say, but we kind of guessed this was to do with the draw on their resources up to Glasgow. Uh, and overall, we felt we'd been treated as though we were a nuisance, frankly. So over the next week, and this is the important point here, we worked with five Liverpool Labour MPs who wrote on our behalf to the Merseyside Chief Constable. We also wrote to the Liverpool Lord Mayor and we wrote to the Council's Select Committee on Climate Change and had a very positive response from the chair of that committee. In effect, we were mobilising legitimacy and demanding 
respect for and use of the democratic space. At the next JAG meeting, the police were a lot more accommodating and discussions became much more straightforward. And I think there's a, there's a lot to contemplate there actually, because as we see our rights to protest being attacked and undermined and the emergence of an increasingly restricted state, it's important to note how popular legitimation can render, in our, in our case, police heavy handedness ineffective and in other perhaps more serious circumstances can um, make legal restrictions inoperable. Now, um, I've already commented upon the way in which different types of activism came together within the coalition and how the momentum over the weeks leading up to the march was helped by the energy of earlier campaigns, the, 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 the Stop the Arms Fair protest uh, and the, the trade union fight at the university. But another aspect was the way in which community energy came into the campaign and into the march itself. We wanted to reach out to communities in Liverpool. So the march was designed with moments built into the route, joining points. Um, as the march went past the Liverpool Cathedral, a choir was singing and apples of friendship were being given out. Um, later at the Chinese gate, a Chinese dragon dance joined the march. Many campaign groups brought their own banners from the Oglet Shaw campaigners and uh, various uh, local environmental campaign uh, campaigns uh, had their own placards. Homemade placards were absolutely everywhere. Students brought flares, uh, which as a sense of excitement and militancy, I have to say. Uh, the speakers on the platform were mainly local activists um, from various unions and campaigns. The Liverpool Socialist Singers sang from the platform. Um, the wonderful baritone, Taylor Luco, sang a politicized version of Wonderful World. And very importantly, um, and, and th this really, I think, for many of us was, was the most moving moment of the, of the day. We had international statements read out. These statements had been sent specifically to us in Liverpool. It was organised by um, activists in the coalition who had personal links through their environmental activism with groups um, around the world. So we had statements read out from activists in the US who were um, focusing on um, the, um, the, the, the grinding of trees, cutting down and grinding of trees to make wood pellets shipped into the Liverpool ports to, the, to go to the Drax power station. Um, um, a statement from Mozambique activists and from the Crajo people of Brazil, very specific to Liverpool, very much about the economic activity of the port zone uh, in Liverpool uh, and really very, very powerful indeed. So, this multifaceted, vibrant character to the march only grew greater as the numbers increased at each of the joining points. At the cathedral especially, the numbers swelled, and as the march came into the city centre, the numbers were over 3,000, despite the absolutely miserable weather. We were all <laughs> drenched, actually. Um, for me, a high point was standing in the middle of Church Street at the front of the march, looking up along Bowl Street, to see March is still turning into the top of Bowl Street. And that, that's when I realised that we had been successful and, and that we, we pulled off uh, a really good demo. There's a lot of learning involved, um, the importance of culture in mobilisation, the importance of starting where people meet you politically and appreciating the political backgrounds that people bring with them to a campaign like this, um, mastering the new organising tools that we have today with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, WhatsApp particularly, um, very, very important organizing tool it's become, dominates my life. Um, and also lear actually learning about my own political tradition, again, a personal comment um, in relation to the climate change movement. So discovering the eco-socialist tradition, going back to the Russian revolution, um, the huge areas of forestry and wilderness that were protected from mining, logging and hunting and other forms of exploitation in the years before forced industrialization under Stalin and the influence um, of socialist thinking on the ecology movement um, in Britain. So figures such as William Morris writing in the 1890s uh, and Arthur Tansley in the 1920s and 30s. I have not known or properly appreciated those aspects of my own political tradition 
in relation to environmentalism until my move, until, until my involvement in this campaign. So the final thing, and I'll finish on this, was simply realizing the speed with which a campaign can grow. And the experience has shown that even with very modest beginnings for a campaign, when we judge things correctly, when we act with boldness and confidence, we can actually achieve a lot. Uh, more fundamentally, I think it shows that when the will to act is there, uh, the desire for a movement to confront the powerful is there, uh, and, the, and the, 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 the call for system change, not climate change, is there. The challenge we face now, of course, uh, is how we take that movement uh, to the next level to overturn the vested interests that keep the capitalist economy locked into the fossil fuel industries and how we destroy, destroy the utterly insane logic, economic logic, that threatens our very existence. Thank you. Uh, so I'll... Um... I won't be I'll, I won't be quite as long as, as Mark. I'm a, a little bit short because I was just asked to reflect on uh, the what happened at Liverpool Hope when we took two coaches of students to Glasgow on that on the, on that day on the sixth of November, um, and obviously uh, there was many more staff and students from Liverpool Hope also went to the Liverpool demonstration as well. So we were involved in both sides in that way. Um, uh, so I want to just sort of put a little bit of background on to why we decided to go to Glasgow. What was what was that about, and where did it come from? And um, really, want to start off with just how we self-define at the School of Social Sciences at Liverpool Hope University. So we do have quite a strong emphasis on uh, notions of social justice and about students playing a role in shaping their world in various different ways. And um, each year. As um, head of school of social science, I'm invited to give uh, an introductory talk or the, the very first lecture that any new student gets is, is, is um, undertaken by the head of each school. So each year I try to do that around the contemporary social problem. So this year, um, I uh, my talk was around what I called the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So we looked at you know the growth of racism and the Black Lives Matter movement. We looked at COVID, we looked at austerity and unemployment and its impact, but absolutely central to that was the climate crisis and what uh, where we were going with the climate crisis and obviously with a focus on what was happening in Glasgow with COP26. And um, as part of the, you know, when the, the chat finishes, there's then some time for questions or some contributions and the students were asking what we could and we should do about it. Now, at that point, there wasn't a COP26 organising the hub uh, in Liverpool, as, as Mark mentioned. It, it, it started really um, about a fortnight after. I think the first meeting was 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 a fortnight after we'd had that initial uh, discussion. So originally, there was some discussion about taking, um, well, we thought one bus uh, up to Glasgow. We thought we'd be able to do well to fill one coach and see how we'd get, go with that. Um, there was then the... Liverpool organising uh, hub, and um, I went along to that. So I was one of the 10 that was at the first meeting and one of the 20 that was at the second meeting. And the intention at that point was that we wouldn't go to Glasgow, that we would just pull everybody to Liverpool as that was uh, the, the main event that was taking place in our city. So we should go to the city. But it was actually the students themselves who, you know, or, or a grouping of the students who said, no, we want to go to Glasgow. We, we were looking forward to this. That's where they're going to be. So at that point, we decided to try and uh, ride on both horses at the same time. So we would try to take some students to Glasgow and we would also indicate that those who didn't want to go or couldn't go for whatever reason should definitely go to the events that were being organised in Liverpool on that day. So um, I think it came out of the, gen the general school commitment to think about issues of, of student uh, justice, or, or social justice. And... Um, it was it was student led in the sense that you know when the option was there they wanted to go to Glasgow in that way. So what what happened in Glasgow? Um, obviously there was a the first demonstration was on the Friday the fifth. We weren't part and parcel of that. That was the young persons uh, march. That was the one that Greta Thunberg spoke at and and led. And we headed up on the sixth um, with some of our students uh, deciding to stay on uh, because after the demonstration the sixth there was the people's summit which you could actually access online from anywhere in the world but was being held in Glasgow 
and included 70 meetings on all sorts of imaginable uh, topics that you could go and take part on um, um, in that, in, in, at that point in time. So reflecting on a, a number of issues that have, that have been raised at the earlier sessions, um, the demonstration in Glasgow was absolutely gigantic. Um, I mean, I come from I, I come from about thirty miles outside of Glasgow, and and you emphasise that wasn't why we ended up going to Glasgow because it was not going home for any reason. But I think it's the biggest demonstration in Glasgow uh, that I had ever been on. Um, and as Mark said, you know I've been to many demonstrations in Glasgow, but there was it was absolutely massive demonstration. It was also, again, similar to what Mark said, given my own traditions are not that far away from Mark's, um, the kind of marches that I would go on, you would have lots of trade union banners and there would be lots of socialist organisations. And, and of course, both of those things were there, but this march was much, much broader than that as well. Um, and, it, and you know, I suppose I scoped up, uh, given its size, was a reflection of what happened and Liverpool, and I think Mark said, it did kind of remind me of the Jubilee drop the debt type demonstrations as well that you that, that, that were around in the 1990s. Um, and also had a little bit of this a feel of some of the large demonstrations that I suppose took off in Seattle in 1999, where you know the world's powerful would come to certain points around the globe and there would be a demonstration outside, which would be pretty dynamic pretty diverse, pretty militant, but we'd have a lot of different people there uh, from that range of backgrounds. So, so there was something of this sort of global protest there. There was certainly something of the more traditional labour and trade union movement there, but there was also something of those broader drop the debt. Um, or if you if, if you were on the, the Edinburgh demonstration on Make Poverty History um, in 2007, I think that was, it, it, you know, there was a feel of it being uh, something similar, similar to that. Um, just as a side, it was also, I think, the only demonstration I've ever been to in Britain, um, not having a go at Mark because I've been there for a long, long time, but I didn't see a single socialist worker cell the entire day. Um, you know, it wasn't one where there were, and I say that because it, it wasn't like those traditional labour type movement uh, marches in that way. I know they were there because some of my friends who are in Socialist Work Asylum were there, but they weren't in terms of the numbers and the scale of it. It, it felt different, I suppose, is what I'm trying to convey. And I think Mark was trying to say uh, something uh, something similar there. One of the things I think that, that we want our students to go either to Liverpool or Glasgow is because I'm a really strong believer that when you immerse yourself in social movements, questions arise about your world or you pose questions in different ways or start to think about answers in different ways. And one of the advantages, I suppose, about having people on a bus for five hours to Glasgow and five hours back is that there's then a space where nobody can go anywhere else. They're stuck in the bus and they have to discuss those, those issues. Uh, I should say we ended up taking not one but two buses uh, to Glasgow in that way. And so one of the interesting things I think about going to the, the larger demonstrations and the scale of that is the impact it has on those who take part on it. And what was definitely interesting is when we stopped for our coffee, I could talk to people from the other, the other coach, but the way in which both groups and both coaches had felt as if they'd been in something significant, were asking about what's going to happen next, were clearly enthused by their experiences, were clearly horrified by the policing of the demonstration in Glasgow, um, they may well have been Liverpool cops because there was an awful lot of Liverpool cops in Glasgow as well uh, that day. But some of the um, some of the sections of the of the march were kettled in, in Glasgow um, and were held back. Some of the young um, group, I think they were Communist Party members, were were kettled for some su substantial time. And again, given the feel of the demonstration, I mean, it was very wet in Glasgow. It was really quite a joyous demonstration. It was completely over policed in that sense. There was absolutely no need for any group to be kettled. There was no, there was no conflict. There was no prospect of conflict. But yet it was the cops that were that were completely overacting. 
to to uh, overreacting to what was to what was happening. And of course, that led to questions. So on the way back, the students were asking me why were groups being treated that way? What 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 were the police doing? So you know, the way in which those interactions open up this place to think about what is the role of police in society, what the role of you know, why can't we just march and take our democratic rights and enter the democratic space, as Mark was talking about, without that conflict and without being policed uh, uh, heavily by, by the state forces in that way. So they were opened up in that way as well. Um, and um, and I think the other, the other thing about going to Glasgow, I suppose, was that it also brought us into con, uh, contact uh, sometimes personally, but just in seeing in terms of the, the the large number of international groups that were on the demonstration in Glasgow. I mean, there was people from all around the world, and it meant it, again really exciting slogans in various different languages, um, placards in various different languages, and which you 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 could see a a microcosm of the kind of global social movement that Jonathan was talking about earlier on that we need to build, of course. 100,000, over 100,000 in Glasgow isn't that movement, but it gives you an, a, a, an insight of what it possibly could look like. Um, I'm just going to finish, but I wanted to finish um, just with a couple of thoughts more about more recently, not so much about the demonstration itself, but about why I think this is becoming really important for us to continue with those mobilizations and those networks. Because obviously we are in Britain, and in Britain, we are facing a Conservative Prime Minister and government, which is in some significant difficulty and infighting over how it's treated us and lied and parted its way through COVID. But one of the interesting things that people might not know is that there's now a pressure group inside the Conservative Party called Net Zero Scrutiny Group, which is um, 20 relatively right-wing Conservative MPs who are working closely with the fossil fuel industry and whose objective is to subvert government pressure, um, any government attempt to get to net carbon zero. They don't think it's necessary. They don't call themselves uh, climate deniers, but they certainly think that there's no rush for climate, um, for, for, for climate change, uh, uh, for, 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 um, for policies to come in to address the climate crisis. And in fact, they are advocating for uh, opening up of more gas and oil wells in the North Sea and in other places. So these are just 18 to 20 Tory MPs. Maybe we shouldn't worry about them, except that they are uh, funded by uh, the, the fossil fuel industry and have got those links. That they are using the techniques that have been used in the past by fossil fuel industry are very well adapted at them, but also the tobacco industry to try and undermine policies and undermine government positions. And what I think is quite insidious about them at the present time is that they are trying to link the cost of living crisis to green policies. So they are arguing that the gas and electricity price increases of the last two weeks are because of the green levies that have been put in place by governments. And if we want to address the cost of living in, uh, in crisis, we need to stop this green nonsense. Now, only 20, but 20 within a Conservative party, which is already in crisis and fighting over the Prime Minister, I think makes them an organised minority that we, should, uh, that we should take account of and be aware of. I don't want to exaggerate them. But I do think it is important that we see that the other side, if you like, are organising and moving, that we shouldn't just assume that everything comes in our direction and that we need to make sure that we stay on the streets, on um, uh, we, we stay organised and that we emphasise, I think, as Mark said at the end, that this is an absolutely crucial, vital fight that we have to win uh, and we have to win relatively quickly if we are not going to condemn parts of human society or all of human society to the most dreadful future. So I wanted to finish really there that whether students went to Liverpool or Glasgow or whether you went to demonstrations in Manchester or London or whether you're from overseas and went to demonstrations in Dublin or Paris or wherever it was that you went to those demonstrations, I hope that one of the consequences of today is that you uh, renew your vigour and your protest and that you stay in your networks and organisations and that you stay on the streets because this is a fight that's only just beginning and it is a fight that we desperately need to win.